35 years ago, that part of the city wasn't as nice as, as it is today. Today, where they used to have parking lots, there's nice plazas to sit in and, and have a cup of coffee, coffee or drink something, eat something. Um, it's nicer today here than what it was back then. The reason for that being that after the Second World War, nearly 90% of the city was destroyed. Can you imagine? It's because of the uh, strategic uh, <coughs> position that the city has. We're right here at the confluence of two rivers. The railroads come through here. They did a lot of bombing um, and destruction after, basically after the war was over. They hadn't had that much up until those final days. So up ahead, when we get back, we won't have quite as long of a walk. We'll be going here closer to the corner, and I'll walk with you back to the ship. Klaus will leave us at that point in 2011. And it, they changed a lot of the traffic flows here, and a lot of the buildings that are here were um, spruced up, and the whole city just really put on its best hat. And we had a picture book summer that summer. We had no rainy days like this. It was just a magnificent summer. So right here is where we'll be getting out. And I'll tell you about the church that's on our right as we get back. So now up ahead you can actually see the Mosel River. The Mosel, some people know it better as the Moselle. It starts way up in France, some 550 kilometers from here, and runs through Luxembourg before it comes into Germany. Once it's in Germany, it's named the Mosel River. And way back in the 60s and 70s, they put in a number of, of locks to make the travel along the rivers much better. They, they put the locks in so they could actually have ship traffic on it. In fact, the Viking River cruises do go up and down the Mosul, not as frequently as the uh, Rhine, of course. But they um, used those locks to get not only the people or the ships through the, the river, but they had one of the first things I'd like to point out to you, though, is the bridge that we're approaching. You can see there's a statue in the middle of the bridge, and it's made out of basalt. And it's a, a statue of the man named Baldwin. And the bridge is called the Baldwin Bridge. He was the main architect of it, and he's the one who also secured the funding for this. And the stones actually come from the town of Vinnigan, which is where we're headed. You can see that they're black basalt stones. They were cut out of a, a, a lava flow that took place there in Vinnigan some 14,000 years ago. And those stones normally would have come from upstream or downstream from the Rhine River, but Baldwin had uh, connections to Vinnigan and was able to secure the stones for the base of the bridge from Vinnigan. You can see this left side is the old bridge. It was from 1342. Was this? bridge established. And the second half is very modern. They had to do that in order for the ships to go up and down the, the, the Mosul River. Now last year we had basically a drought here and the river was so low that you could see more sandbars from what we're seeing right now. It was more sand than, than river. This year it's been quite the contrary uh, picture. Once we're under these two modern bridges, you can actually see that lock. The fish stairway is on the left-hand side. And an interesting thing about that stairway is the fact that there's another animal that uses our rivers here. It's the eel. And an eel has a very interesting life cycle. They come to the Mosul River, and they cannot jump up through those fish stairs. So they kind of congregate here, and the fishermen come along and collect the little baby eels, transport them up the stream to a, a place that they would normally make it to without the help, and there they spend the next seven to 18 years maturing. A fully matured eel will then kind of congregate again by these uh, locks until the lockmeister says, oops, they're getting there again. They'll slow the turbines down enough so that the eel can slip through there without being killed. That's why they say slipper is an eel. And when they've made it through, they actually 
will migrate across the entire Atlantic Ocean over to the Sagasu Sea, which is near the Bermudas, and that's where they spawn and die. And then the little baby eels, either as little tiny itsy bitsy eels, or they wait a while, but they end up coming across the entire Atlantic again and starting that whole cycle again. They come back over here to mature and to spawn. Or oh. come over here to mature and go back there to wow. spawn. It's just an incredible thing. It's a little bit like the monarch butterflies. Nobody could really are those the same eels they have in Holland? I, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. And they, they have, and they all have just certain places that they go. They'll go to Holland. There's places that they go throughout all of Europe, but they all come back over here to do their maturing. Do you like eel? I love eel. I do too. A lot of people say, oh, I wouldn't even think about eating it. Good. I think it's wonderful. The special ones in Holland, they're hard to get now. Yeah. Well, they, I read that they do here between 10,000 and 15,000 eel go up and down the river each year, which is a pretty high amount of uh, eel. My mother-in-law loves eel, and she knows of a special place to go and, and buy it, for special events. Like at Christmas time, we'll have an eel as uh, an appetizer. In, in Holland, you have to know somebody now just to get oh, Really? You have to have the vitamin B. They say vitamin B here for bitsium, meaning you have to know somebody. Now the area that we're approaching here is a much more modern area. It's been built up in the last years as an administration center. And right here to the left of us is the uh, military administration in this area. And they put on a pretty ugly building up two mosaics that depict the Mosul and Rhine rivers. In this area, there's also the unemployment office, the uh, financial office, surveyor. There's two hospitals. There's quite a number of official people working here, and so a lot of people work in this general area. Is it Aldi? What's that? Aldi, because we have Aldi yeah, in the uh, States. Yeah, they're finally getting there? over there. We shop them for Aldi. Yeah, uh, you know what? I never used to think that Aldi was that great, and, and they're getting better all the time. <laughs> oh, they're wonderful. <laughs> they really are. There's a lot of things that at first I thought, nah, you can't do that, you can't buy that there. And then I would try it, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is it's so much mm -hmm. less expensive that yes. in the end I say to myself, well, I think there's something I have to do with that money instead. Yes. <laughs> I was a long time fan of a certain washing uh, detergent. Right. That converted. So now I do. Yeah, it's amazing. Here we have now uh, another side effect of those locks is that the river here gets real still. It becomes almost a lake atmosphere. And people will use it almost as a lake with their boats and their sailboats rowing, paddling, uh, swimming, all kinds of nice water activities. Generally, when the weather's a little warmer, you see it, all kinds of people out there, but most of the time on the weekends, it's really, really busy on the Mosul River. Glad for. Now if you look across, you can see the first, or the last as they may call it, of the vineyards along the Mosul that is terraced. You can see it's terraced with roads going through it horizontally, of course, and the vineyards are set up in a horizontal way. When you came down the Rhine, you see quite often, especially there by Beaupark, you see quite often vertical vineyards where the people go up and down the slopes. Here on the Mosul, we tend to go across the slopes quite often. There's a couple of reasons for that. Having worked in the vineyards, I much prefer going across the hill to do my work, going from one plant to the next, going across the hill rather than going up and down. I don't like going up and down. Um, when they go up and down, they can use certain machinery there. They can set up a tractor that will go down and, and you can winch up a plow up the hill to do some groundwork. You can do the same things sometimes if it's not too steep here, if you've got enough of a track between each row, but that means an entire new setup for the winemaker. And that's what's interesting too, is that every winemaker here on the, in, in Germany basically has his own methods of doing things. And every person decides for himself which way is the best way for me to be doing my vineyards. The vineyards here are owned privately by the people who basically work them. 
Um, the town we're going to visit today, Vinnegan, has 25 full-time winemakers there. They have the largest population of full-time winemakers in this entire area. There's no town that has more winemakers than that. In fact, if you put all the winemakers in this entire region together, you might get 25 out of them. And of course, with that kind of, uh, and I won't call it competition, they actually work together more as co comrades. They have a very collective feeling about their, what they're doing together. And they, they enjoy working with each other. They help each other a lot. Here again, you can see how they, they have a, uh, the rows are far enough apart that a very small tractor could go through there. And you can see how they're starting to get up and, and over the tops of the wires. Pretty soon there's a machine, that, and you can see up ahead they've already done it. These haven't been cut back yet. They haven't, the tops aren't cut back yet. Right up ahead you can see that they've been cut back. And I think a machine went through there and did those rows. Each one of those rows was done with a, it's kind of a machine that goes up and over it and cuts it with that. Very efficient. It looks more like a hedge now than, than, a, than a big one. You don't tie them back horizontally to the wires like we do in the States. Well, they, they, the wires are as high as they need to be for the next year's growth. And so the, the wires are holding them up into those rows so that you don't, so that you can actually still make it through there. They get so wild that you can't make it anymore. And you only need as much growth as far as the height goes as what you can use for the next year's cane to make it over the wire to do the bowing. So we, we don't tie them to the wires. We do more of an enveloping. Take, you take the row and you have two people and you pull the wires up and envelope them in. That's how we, that's how we do the, the tying. Now if it's an individual pole, then we tie it to the pole. And it's, it's one grapevine after the, after the next. So it's a lot more work to do it that way. That's why a lot of winemakers have gone to the uh, wire construction. Now you will see some, what we call the Trier rod, or the, the wheel from Trier. And it's a, it's round, it's, it's like a, a plate at the top of the pole. And they cut in the wintertime all around in a circle around that plate, or around that tire. And then the sprouts will come off in all different directions, but they stand about as tall as I am. And, and the grapes are up there in the air. <coughs> And you don't have to tie them at all. So they're very labor, uh, non-intense. That's probably the easiest way you can do your vineyards. Most people won't do that until it's gotten to be a very old uh, vineyard that somehow got out of control anyway. If they, if they keep going up too high, because that is very high, uh, this wheel. Now when you look across the river, you can actually see the first of the, of the larger fields that belong to Vinegan. Now these vineyards in the, in the very beginning are called the Vinegener Rutgen, and they have many terraces with the, the, the walls. You can see that above those terraced uh, vineyards are some rather wide fields at the top of the mountain. The terraced vineyards have a very high quality, and the flatter uh, vineyards at the top have a, a lower quality, generally. Every year is different. Depends quite often on, on how much um, rain and sunshine you have. This year with all the rain we've got, these um, vineyards that are on the front of the mountain are at an advantage to a degree. They get a, they've got enough water and they're getting more sunlight. Even when it's a day like this, they're getting more sunlight than the, the vineyards at the top where it's uh, not quite as exposed to the, uh, to the sun. We are at about 49 degrees north latitude here. Normally this would be above the average wine growing region and it's only because of these steep hillsides that we can actually get the quality that we get up here. The hillsides actually make that tilting, that they give us a microclimate that gives them enough sunshine to have their good quality growth. So in a drier year, do you have to irrigate? No, we, uh, the Riesling grape has an incredibly deep uh, root system. They go down some 45 feet into the ground. Whoa. 45 feet? 45 feet. They have one of the deepest root systems that uh, exist. And they go down into the ground. Uh, these younger fields, you can see them, 
right there is a very young field. Now when they first plant those, and if you have a year like last year was, last year was very, very dry, the winemaker can go in with a hose and, and water the plants. But we don't, we don't have irrigation. We could do it if it had to be done. We could do it by law, but generally it's a very expensive proposition. And we don't know of anyone who irrigates here. I've never, I've never seen it done. But you can see there's always a patch of newly planted grapevines. Uh, grapevine, the newly planted one. So if a white vine replanted, it takes three years before you get a substantial growth from that grapevine, the newly planted one. So if a winemaker has, say, 40,000 grapevines and he's going to work for 40 years in the vineyards, if he replaces every year 1,000 grapevines in his lifetime, he will have replaced all of the vines at least once. And 40 years is a pretty good lifetime for a grapevine. They can live longer, they will live longer if you don't take them out. In fact, you can see 40, here we 40. have every now and then places where vineyards used to be. By law, they have to take the, uh, the, uh, the grapevines out because no one's working with them anymore, no one's spraying them, no one's keeping them disease free. They become uh, a hazard to the other winemakers in the area. So they do remove any old vineyards that aren't being worked anymore by law. And this side of the river not being as um, well positioned has a much lower quality. And you can see they've never gone up very far. They, and they're, they're kind of the stepchildren. And this side of the mountain will probably never be uh, reworked as much as the other side. The other side, the vineyards there are, are highly valued. And, and if oh, yeah. someone decides to give up their winery, the neighbor or a fellow winemaker will definitely take over your uh, property. They don't generally sell a vineyard. Generally, they'll rent a property or rent a vineyard. They're always, I think most winemakers here kind of fear the idea that maybe one day a child will come back and say, oh, I wanted to do that, and now we've got nothing. Now, when you look right here, you see an, an island full of campers, and now it's starting to fill up again. Two weeks ago, that poor island was cut off from the rest of the world and people were, were, were wringing their hands in fear that their, their camper caravan would be washed away. They're coming back slowly but surely now. It's looking more like a regular summer than what it did a couple weeks ago. It was, it was nasty. They, they have only one little road that they can cross, and it's pretty close to the river level, so it's, it became impassable, and they had a, a real hand-wringing time for a while. Now the bridge you see straight ahead of us is the Autobahn Bridge for the num number 61. That starts down by Ludwigshaven and goes up to about Cologne. And that bridge was built between 1969 and 1972. And it, if you want to think about what a, a kilometer is, from the left to the right across this valley is exactly one kilometer. That's how long the bridge is. It's a steel construction, the, the part that they're driving over, and then these huge cement base supports. The, the color blue that you see was always painted blue, but the original paint job was done with a lead-based paint, and about 10 years ago they had to repaint it. They had to remove all that lead-based paint and repaint it, and the actual cost was nearly as high as the, the original building. <coughs> Back in the 70s, it cost them 40,000 Deutsche Mark to build that, 40,000 million. Nate, 40, Nate, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing right. 40 million, 40 million mark is what it cost. It was like 20 million euro. And to repaint it, it didn't cost quite 20 million, but to keep the whole thing in condition, they're constantly having to do maintenance up there. So we're going to park here for a moment because we have a wine in all of Europe. It's called the Ulen. You can see that the name is written there on that one wall, right here, Winninger Uhlen. Um, when you when you want to think of the name Winning, think of Winning, and then add an E-N, then you have Winnigan. And we call things when it's coming from this area, it's the Winninger Uhlen.
Um, this year was a bad year for the uhu because they didn't have enough mice. Is it like the great horned owl? Or Perhaps. I'm not sure whether it's related to any, I mean, there's so many different species out there. How do you spell it? U H U. U H U. And we say uhu. Uhu. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, no, it's a beautiful owl. I've only seen them in zoos. I've never uh -huh. seen one here, but that's what, in earlier times there were some uhus that lived here and that's where the name came from. Now, Finnegan, the village back there, owns clear up to about where we are now, where that cross is down there, the little cross in the middle. Beyond that, that all becomes Coburn, which is where I spent 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> the it's Vinegar, it's the, the, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can see there's a little, it's always a little compactor and a winch, and you have to have a clear shot at it. There can't be any curves in the, in the track. There can't be any hills. It has to be very even. The one right next to it here to the left, you can see there's a little machine on a single rail. That's yeah. the, the oh, way of the yeah. future. Those are called monoracks, and there's actually, it's got little cogs underneath it, little um, places for the, the uh, machine to catch on to, and the, and the machine that pulls it up is very similar to a very strong motorcycle, mm -hmm. and the second part of it is like a little wagon that you can load up with whatever you need to load on there. If you're taking people up there, you can take people up there. So it always has to be a driver in that front section, and then you can put whatever, whatever you want in the back section. They can carry up stones to do the wall repair, fertilizers. Um, when they're harvesting, they bring the grapes down with that. And when we, when we harvest, we go from one grapevine to the next. Each person has a bucket and a pair of scissors, and you, you harvest one grapevine and then move on to the next one. When your bucket's filled, the guy with that big bucket on his back comes and you dump your grapes into his bucket and that's how we get the grapes down the hill. They, uh, we harvest here in about at the very, very earliest, depending on the summer, it starts at the end of September, the whole month of October and goes into November. We never, ever, ever harvest when it rains. Can you imagine why? You want to have a high sugar level in your grapes. And if you've got water in your grapes, you're lowering that sugar level that you've worked